Between 1.6 and 3.8 million Americans will suffer a sports-related concussion this year. New studies show that even minor head hits may cause brain injuries. Tonight, our panel of experts will explain Pennsylvania's new youth concussion bill and answer your questions about this new measure. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242. Or if you prefer to email your question or comment, our address is connect at psu.edu. You may also tweet questions at WPSU Connect. Now let's meet our guest. Ruben Echemendia is a neuropsychologist and owner of Psychological and Neurobehavioral Associates in State College. Uh, Allison uh, Kry Kryevsky is the head athletic trainer at State College High School and the clinical coordinator of athletic training services for University Orthopedic Center. Adam Yarger is a student athlete at Penns Valley Area High School. He was forced to retire uh, from sports at last year at the age of 17 due to multiple head injuries. Thank you all so much for joining us. This past November, Governor Tom Corbett signed a statewide youth concussion law, making Pennsylvania the th uh, 35th state to have such a law. You helped write that legislation. Give us some details. Uh, what does that law require? Sure. The, the law that came into play here in, in Pennsylvania was modeled after a law in Washington state that has primarily three major components. The first component is that of education, so educating the athletes, the parents, the coaches. The second component is to make sure that an athlete who is suspected of having a concussion is removed from the field of play and is evaluated and not returned to play unless that athlete has gotten written clearance from a medical professional who has specialty training in the area of evaluation and management of concussions. Those are the three primary components of the law. Now, as I said, you were involved in, in writing this legislation. Did you get everything in this bill that you wanted? I think we did, uh, certainly that I wanted. We, we wanted it to be a comprehensive bill. We wanted it to be a bill that had some teeth or some consequences to it and that also clearly took the first step in ensuring safety for our athletes and making sure that our athletes are getting evaluated properly and then returned to play in the proper way. Uh, you're involved in, in coach training, Allison. Give yes. us an idea of how coaches are responding to this new law and, and when, uh, when the changes take effect. Immediately, are coaches having to get the training we in, start, in concussions uh, health? Yes. Actually, we've started here in this district doing that immediately just to be ahead of the curve. And really, the response has been pretty good. It's all on the internet, it's easy to do, it doesn't take a whole lot of time, and they're, so far the training options that they have are easy to understand. It gives them the basics of what they need to look for, and then it gives them the options of who they need to turn to. So the response so far from our coaches has been very good. Okay, and you're someone who has suffered a, not just one concussion, but, but four concussions. Right. Before we talk a little bit about your own experience, how do you feel about this new law? Uh, I, I actually think it's a really great idea because I feel a lot of kids don't really understand like what a concussion is and how it can affect you. But yeah, I, I think it's great because then it, it'll give the kid time to recover and then also feel better and then they can return to whatever sport they were doing. And does it take some of the pressure off, you know, be, uh, there's, there is this attitude that you need to tough it out, you need to take the hits mm -hmm. in football and some other sports. Yeah, it, see, I, from my experience, a lot of kids are always like, oh no, I'm alright, I'm alright, but it, really you're not alright, like you need to get checked out, so it's really good that they're putting this into law that you need to get checked out by someone who is certified in that field. Before I find out about your own experience, tell us what exactly, uh, Dr. Echemendia, is a concussion? What happens to your brain when you have a concussive uh, uh, injury? The best way to understand a concussion is that it's an acceleration-deceleration injury. What that means is if you think of the brain inside fluid inside the skull, there's an acceleration and deceleration that occurs, so the brain is moving back and forth once you get hit. That movement back and forth creates all sorts of changes at the cellular level at the brain so that the brain's chemistry is actually changed. And it's, it's that, those changes in the brain's chemistry that create the difficulties and the symptoms that we see. So tell us, Adam, what were the symptoms? You were playing football, uh, you're in eighth grade, and you, you take a hit. You, you, it, uh, tackle. Well, the number one symptom that I had was a really nasty headache, and then right after the headaches and stuff, it'd probably be like dizziness. I wasn't too confused on where I was. Like, I had a pretty good understanding. I could remember stuff, but I was just really out of it. It was like I was really, really tired, and I was really sensitive to light, 
And it, it was just nasty because I, I couldn't stand and I'd always be wobbling and stuff like that. And it was, those are the main symptoms that I really felt and they really stuck with me over all of my concussions actually. So your team, your coach said you're out of the game, Adam, mm -hmm. there was no oh, yeah, question definitely. about it. Yeah, I made the hit and uh, my dad always says how like the whole left side of my body was shut off and my left arm and my left leg were dragging as they were like helping me off the field and I, s I was sitting in the, the cart to take me down and they said I was just being goofy or whatever. <laughs> Now, Adam had a baseline test before the football season began, so you really could look and see uh, what impact this concussion had on him. Right. The baseline test allows us to get an idea of what an athlete looks like cognitively before they have the injury. So after the injury, we're able to compare the post-injury scores to the pre-injury scores and be able to do that relatively well. Having said that, however, it's also important to note that even if you don't have a baseline test. It's important to be tested post-injury because we can take a look at what your cognitive function is like and be able to compare it back to estimates of what it was like or what you were like prior to having the concussion. Research indicates, Allison, that football is, is the team sport where uh, the risk for concussion is highest. Yes. Give us an idea, in a school district like State, uh, State High, how common is it uh, for the kinds of hits that result in a concussion? It's incredibly common, actually. I think um, it's been common along all through the years, but more and more education has made people aware of what it is. But to see on um, a team of 80 to 100 kids, to see 25% at least suffer some type of, you know, some form of concussion, mild, moderate, or even more severe, similar to Adam's, it would not be uncommon. We do see, a, and I think the numbers are definitely we're struggling with trying to get those down, but the reporting has been much better. Is the attitude changing uh, game day among parents? I mean, there I, I've read and, and seen actually mm -hmm. parents who their their son has taken a hit and they're saying, get him back in the game, he's okay, he's okay, he can play. And that does happen. Um, again, that's changing as we get you know more and more information. The education of the coaches, the education of the parents, and even the kids. The kids will report on one another. They know that when their friend is not you know, acting like himself or herself, that they're coming to us. And I think the education is more going to be part of this generation because it's something that they're more familiar with. And the parents are becoming more familiar with it. But they're still of a generation that did just kind of suck it up and keep going. So how long were you out of the game, Adam? Uh, the first concussion in eighth grade, that was, uh, I think, about three, three months that I'd have headaches and dizziness all day for the, that three months. And then I just sort of started to feel a little bit better on my own and slowly get back to normal. And then uh, these other concussions, it was three months plus that I'd have headaches and dizziness and just feeling. And the other concussions were in wrestling. Mm -hmm. now, now how common is it, Dr. Echemendia, um, for someone who's had a concussion, um, is it easier for them to have a subsequent concussion? Absolutely. One of the things that we know is that once you've had your first concussion, you're anywhere between two to six times more likely to have another concussion. So it's very common to see what happened with Adam with other athletes. So two more concussions in wrestling. Mm -hmm. And when and how? Describe for me what it was like when, when the verdict is you really ought to give up sports. Someone uh, who had a very promising wrestling uh, career ahead of him. Yeah, it was like it was the third one that I got the news that like you might need to stop but uh, they did say you're done at the on my third concussion they said you're done but uh, then I got another chance and I went for it. You got another chance at wrestling? Yeah but it was like or it wasn't my third one sorry it's my second one where we were like uh, should we stop or should we keep going and then my third one is when everything was called off. Now, Adam mentioned some of the symptoms. Uh, of course, everyone has different symptoms. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what are signs that you ought to be looking to see if there's a concussion? And, th and then what would be appropriate treatment? Well, uh, the, the classical symptoms of a concussion are headache, nausea, dizziness, some disorientation, difficulties with lights and noise, 
uh, difficulties with sleep, both initiating sleep, sleeping too long, sleeping too little, and also a lot of emotional changes such as depression and anxiety and frustration, irritability. All of these factors come into play with a concussion. So if you're on the sideline and you're watching a game and you see somebody take a hit, you see a youth athlete take a hit, and they come back to and they look like they're a little bit wobbly, they look like they may be a little different than they typically are, that's a time to take a look. That's a time to pull them off the field. And that's where it's great to have athletic trainers on the sideline who actually know these players. They know what these players' personalities, so they can tell when a player is, is not being themselves and they're able to to at that point help recognize what may not be such an obvious situation. Are players more inclined to take the advice and sit out knowing now because it, it's so pervasive what we're hearing with NFL uh, stars saying I have signs of dementia, Parkinson's disease, they're, they're saying all kinds of things that they are attributing at least uh, to to concussions in professional ball. I actually think that's been one of the most helpful things is when the professional athletes are honest about what's going on because the younger kids look to them and if they see someone who's going out and playing with symptoms like this and then admitting it, they think it's okay too and that's not the reality. So when the professional athletes are you know, upfront and honest saying we need to get out of the game and this is what can happen, the high school athletes and the college athletes are paying attention. And some of the high school athletes, they do still try to hide you know, or they won't come forward right away. But they are getting better at admitting to it. I was surprised to read that there are more concussive hits among high school football players than among college football players. Yes, there are. And there's a couple different factors with that. I mean, number one, the age group that you're dealing with is much more susceptible to this type of thing. Um, and that's just the way their brain is made at this point. The strength differences are there. You know, you're not you know, you haven't been lifting in the weight room for 10 years of your life preparing for those hits. And there's also some hits from kids who, they're not proficient at their sport yet. And, you know, they might get, you know, hit from the side and not even realize what's going on because they weren't prepared for that. Whereas you get to be a professional and you know a little bit more about what to watch for. And that's part of what you're doing, isn't it? Training, uh tr training players on how to hit. Yes. A, a way that's not going to hurt them. Yes. Or less likely to hurt them. The attempts, yes, the coaching staffs are now more aware and education is part of it for the kids and also even strength programs, concentrating on certain muscle groups so that they're given the advantage of strength um, to help. And you can't always prevent something like this, but you do try to do things with education and strengthening that would help decrease. What's the impact of a typical hit today? And there, I don't know exactly how you can answer that, but I, I'm asking it because it's not unusual for a player to be 250 pounds even in high school today. They're bigger, they're faster, and it's more aggressive play than it certainly was a decade or so ago. There's no question that the forces are greater now than they've ever been. As you said, players are bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. The games, many of the rules have changed in order to encourage the games to be faster, in order to, to have more hits. So we're starting to see greater impact forces, and then we're starting to see greater numbers of concussions uh, accordingly. When did you start playing football, Adam? Uh, I was actually started playing in sixth grade. I played up at the the church here and then from there I went down in seventh and eighth grades when I played. And this was full contact in, mm -hmm. in sixth grade. Oh, yeah. And the movement is we're seeing first graders playing full contact football and I'm wondering what your view is of that. I, I think that we need to we need to be very careful that we stop having our youth athletes trying to be professional athletes and that we need to have age appropriate rules we need to have age-appropriate practices. We need to have age-appropriate strength training programs. And many times you don't see that. Many times you see coaches trying to emulate the professional coaches when they have 13 and 14-year-olds. And that's really not the best approach. There are, there's a movement afoot now to begin to limit practices, to begin to limit the number of practices at the youth level, to practice less with pads, than, than not, to, to change the, the type and the amount of hitting. You know, it's interesting that in baseball we count the number of pitches that a pitcher has in order to reduce injury to the arm, but we don't bother doing that with the brain. And w there's a movement afoot now to begin to start doing more of that so that we try to minimize or lessen 
the chances of concussion. We're not going to eliminate them, but we can certainly try to lessen them. Uh, of course, with young kids, we've got developing brains, so I'm wondering what the extra concerns are uh, when, when, let's say, a first, second, third grader gets a concussion. Well, so you said it. it, it it's a developing brain. It's a brain that has more requirements for resources, more requirements for energy. It, 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 the brain is starting to develop networks at that point in time. And if there are injuries at that point, then you may see a lot of difficulties downstream. And particularly that we know that once you've had a concussion, chances are you're going to get another concussion if you continue in contact sports, that those multiple concussions occurring later on may have some difficulties down the road in terms of le learning, memory, and things like that. Second impact syndrome. Th that's certainly a possibility. Though second impact is is very rare, and it's a, it's a very controversial um, injury at this point. And what second impact syndrome is, is when you have a concussion, then you get another hit to the brain before the brain has had a chance to heal. And in those situations, sometimes you get what's called a dysregulation of the blood flow in the brain, the brain engorges, and then all sorts of bad things start to happen at that, that point. You just said it was rare, and yet I'm reading that 40% of high school athletes who suffer a concussion uh, return to action prematurely, and, and the concern is this second impact syndrome. Right. That's, that's been the concern that's been talked about for a long time. But we have to remember that second impact syndrome is really, it, it is very rare. It, it, luckily, it is very rare. We don't see it very often. And the controversy that exists around it is that, that many individuals at this point in time believe that you don't need that second impact in order to create the problem, that a single impact can create the type of dysregulation and problems in the brain that is thought to occur with second impact. So I think that our emphasis needs to be, we don't want to put athletes back out there prematurely because we're putting their brain at greater risk for bad things happening, irrespective of what that bad thing may be, whether it be second impact syndrome or whether it be prolonged symptoms for three months, four months, a year, two seasons. That's what we really need to be careful of. All right. If you're just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live, the new concussion bill on WPSU-TV. Uh, let me reintroduce our guest. Ruben Echemendia is a neuropsychologist and owner of Psychological and Neurobehavioral Associates in State College. Allison Krajewski is the head athletic trainer at State College High School and clinical coordinator of athletic training for services for University Orthopedic Center. Adam Yarger is a student and former athlete who was forced to retire from contact sports due to multiple head injuries. Uh, did it take a lot of convincing, though, for you not to get back into the game? Uh, and what was your parents' reaction? Well, on my first concussion, there was no doubt I was not going back to play because it just wasn't going to happen. But uh, the other concussions, they were during practices. So it was like, I get the hit, I'm done with practice and then we'll work from there. But uh, having to give up wrestling altogether is probably one of the toughest things I've ever had to do because it was literally my life and that's all I would do. I would, I'd go to tournaments on the weekend growing up and I would train and just really work hard at it and, and then having to get that taken away from me, it was like, it was like the death of someone because that's how much it meant to me. That sounds pretty typical. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And you've told professionals this, this ought to be your last game. Right. It's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it, it, what makes it especially hard is that we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know with 100% certainty what's going to happen. And we have to, to make our best guess based on the pattern that we've seen. So it, it is a very hard thing to do, not just at the professional level, but at the college level, at the high school level, at every level, because athletes very much take their athletic competition as part of their identity. It's part of who they are. And when you tell them, well, you can't be that person anymore, that's a very difficult thing to do. Now, we've spent the first 20 minutes here talking mostly about football and, and wrestling, but girls are at particular risk yes. for concussion. Girls soccer is one of the higher ranking ones. So girls are just as susceptible to certain types of things. And again, it goes back to what Dr. Etchemendia was saying. It's not necessarily getting hit by a 250 pound person. It's, you know, what, where was the hit and how many have you had and what was the activity going on there? It's like a physics kind of game. What was the angle? 
you know, how fast was the object coming? And that can alter even a girl's sport, depending on what they're playing. Speaking of altering a sport, uh, that, that makes me think of uh, Rule 48 in, in hockey and, and hits to the certain hits to the head. Has it made much of a difference in the number of concussions you see? Because I know you work with the National um, Hockey League. It's certainly made a difference in the number of concussions that happen from blindside or lateral hits to the head. We've seen a dramatic decrease in that. Uh, how about protective wear? Um, I've read about, and it's not uncommon in a lot of school districts, where uh, young players like Adam are wearing the same helmets that their parents wore when they played football. So first of all, how far has uh, helmet technology gone? How, how much attention is being paid to that? Oh, a lot. In the past you know, even decade, even past five years, you know, there's been studies being done on the type of helmets and the type of equipment that people need to be wearing across the board, not just in football, but you also have different, you know, changes being made in the sport of field hockey or lacrosse in order to try to protect the kids. The reality is the brain moves inside the skull. So even when I protect the skull with the helmet, I'm not guaranteeing anything. But um, helmet technology has definitely come a long way. And we, you know, as athletic trainers, are educated in how to fit someone properly to do everything we can to prevent a helmet from flying off or from a helmet not fitting correctly, you know, in order to ward off other types of hits. Because it could be a small hit that starts the process. And we do try to make sure that they have helmets that are, you know, reconditioned correctly. Um, they are only allowed to be a certain amount of years old, that type of thing. They're properly fit on the, you know, on the kid, trying to do stuff like that. Now, Allison mentioned uh, uh, something about the helmet and, and it's protecting you, your skull, but again, your, your brain is still moving within this fluid. So does the helmet to some extent give us a false sense of security that, that our brains are protected? Well, helmets are very good, modern helmets are very good at doing what they were designed to do, and that is to protect against skull fracture or to protect against a penetrating head injury. They were not designed to protect against concussion, and in all reality, they don't. Protect. And yet there are parents paying $350 for a helmet that they think is going to prevent their child from getting a concussion. Right, and there, there are no data to support the notion that a hard shell helmet, the typical helmet that we have, the polycarbonate shell, is going to protect against a concussion. Because as Allison said, what happens is if you have a hard shell, typically that's translating the forces inside the brain, and the brain is still moving back and forth. So you're still going to have a concussion. But you may not have the skull fracture. You may not have the other types of brain injury for which those helmets were designed to protect. So it's very important to have a good helmet. Mm -hmm. but it's um, inaccurate to say that that helmet is going to protect against a concussion. Is there a sport for which a helmet doesn't make sense? I, I think there was a big uh, <laughs> debate about pole vaulting, for example, whether pole vaulters should wear a helmet or shouldn't. I, I think it depends on what you're trying to protect against. And the, the issue of pole vaulting in particular, the the helmet in pole vaulting may not protect against an 18-foot drop onto concrete. But it is going to protect against the pole vaulter who hits the mat and flies off the mat and then hits the concrete because it's going to stop that type of skull fracture, that kind of penetrating head injury that may otherwise be the case. There's a huge debate right now in unhelmeted sports whether they should be helmeted or not be helmeted. The classic example is girls lacrosse and whether girls in lacrosse should be wearing a helmet, the guys wear helmets, why is it that the girls aren't wearing helmets? Well, the reality is it's a very different game between girls lacrosse and men's lacrosse, and the fear is that if you put helmets on girls in lacrosse, they're going to start acting like guys. <laughs> they're going to be much more aggressive, they're going to continue to get the same number of concussions, but in a different way at this point in time. Is it possible that, and, and are people talking about minor changes in the game to protect uh, especially young athletes' brains? I would have to say yes. Um, we see it, like Dr. Shemendia mentioned, a number of hits during a practice might be monitored. Um, how many hitting practices do you have? How many full padded practices do you have? I do think that ultimately some of your higher risk sports are going to see changes in the way the game is played in order to protect the athletes. And I think that even, you know, what we're seeing now is age dependent. 
um, in terms of what can we do for the high school age or the middle school age child and, and not as much at the professional level even though the changes are sometimes implemented and thought through at the higher levels it does trickle down and help with the lower levels but yeah the game will be changing Speaking of, of the lower levels, I, I think you're now coaching mm -hmm. wrestling. Yeah, so I coach you're still in the high. game. You're still involved yeah. in the game. Yeah, they couldn't take <laughs> me away from it, so <laughs> I'm giving back to it. But uh, yeah, I coached junior high guys, and uh, it, as, as hard as it is to sit there and watch them wrestle, knowing that I can't, it, I just I feel like I'm proud to coach them, to give them my knowledge, and uh, see the outcome of what they can do. And do you think there's something that you've learned through this experience, this horrible experience, uh, that can help protect them from getting a concussion? Uh, yeah, I, I sort of told him, I was like, you guys got to be honest. If, if you do end up hurting yourself somehow, whether it be like concussion or you break like your arm, be honest. That way you don't get long-term effects and get even more hurt. And you, you talked about some of the, uh, you know, headaches for three months. At this stage of the game, are you suffering from anything that you would attribute to, to your, at this point, four concussions? Uh, no, actually, uh, I, like, I feel really good. And I, I'm just getting off of a fourth concussion, and I just feel great. And your fourth concussion, uh, your fourth concussion was, was falling. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked earlier that once you've had a concussion, you're more prone to, to a subsequent concussion. That's right. And, and in Adam's case, that's, that's a good example where there wasn't, a, there wasn't even a direct hit to the head that, that caused a concussion, but just the transmission of forces when he fell going to his head and being more vulnerable. He ended up having the symptoms. Okay, we have a, a, an email question. My daughter fell very hard during an indoor girls soccer game and was unconscious for 20 to 30 seconds. She's in the sixth grade. Her doctor said she can return to play as soon as any concussion sy symptoms go away. Do we want to send her back too soon? We don't want to send her back too soon. Are there ways to really know when the time is right to return? Her symptoms have been very moderate. Well, the... The first thing, it's not all right to return her to play uh, once her symptoms clear. There, there should be a clear progression in terms of returning her to play. First, she needs to be symptom-free at rest for a period of at least 24 to 48 hours. If she was unconscious for the period of time that you said, I would probably make that 72 hours. I would have her be completely symptom-free at rest for 72 hours. And then I would begin a graded progression of exercise, starting with no impact aerobic exercise, gradually increasing over time to see how her brain responds to that increased pressure. That goes through a full progression, including towards the end, heading uh, progression so that we can see how she responds to heading the ball if she's playing indoor soccer. And then she should have cognitive testing to make sure that there are no cognitive symptoms that are lingering even though the physical symptoms have recovered. So it, I do not agree that it's as simple as having her symptoms clear and she, she, and she should return to play. And I would suggest that you have your daughter be seen by someone who specializes in this area in order to make a more informed return to play decision. All right, and here's another email question. The State College area does not seem to have many concussion physicians. With the new law, will we see more concussion specialists in this area, Allison? Ooh, that's a tough one for me. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully Dr. Etchemendia can help with that one. I think that we're going to start seeing far more physicians becoming much more educated in the area of concussion evaluation and management. There, there's this perception that once you get a degree, whether it be in, in neuropsychology or in medicine or in whatever area, that you're automatically trained to deal with everything. And the, the fact is that you're not. And many very good physicians, many very good neuropsychologists do not have training in the evaluation and management of concussion. And that's something that, that you should ask and find out about in terms of the person that you're seeing. Now, she was talking about, this, this person who emailed was talking about State College sports, and you are on the sidelines at State College uh, games. Wh which games? Uh, primarily the football games. Football games. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering how common that is around the state. My guess is that it's not very common for a school team to be able to afford or to have someone uh, with your kind of specialty available. 
That's true. It, it's probably something that, that doesn't happen very often, but that doesn't mean that people can't be educated. That doesn't mean that we need to, to heighten the awareness, because I firmly think that, that we could and, and that we should. Let's talk about this training then. The training mm -hmm. for coaches is online. Yes. How extensive is it? It's a basic model. They're not going to get into you know what exactly is going on into the brain, but it but it gives them the symptoms that they might see, things they need to be aware of when they're watching their athletes on the field. You know, did, do they look a little bit out of it? Do they come over and hang their head? You know, do they complain of a headache? So it gives them an idea about the the symptoms that they might be having and then the role they need to take in terms of either advising the athlete, in terms of seeing a doctor, making sure that they keep the athlete out of play, um, and making sure that they talk to an athletic trainer, to a doctor, that the parents are made aware of the situation, and then the coaches will know through this training that those are their options to make sure the kid is taken care of. Some people I've talked to are afraid that this new law will increase the liability that coaches face. It, it's true, I mean, but there's a liability across the board. You know, whenever you decide to play a sport, there's automatically a liability because you're not guaranteed a completely safe environment all the time. There are extenuating and external forces that happen. So when you play a sport, any sport, there are risks. And when it comes to the liability, people are definitely with this new law looking to the coaches to be responsible in their decisions about the athletes. Do you think you may lose coaches as a result of this new law? I think some of the coaches are probably a little nervous, you know, but I also think that their awareness is heightened to make sure that that kid who's slow to get up, that they go and talk to them instead of just let them go to the bench and then put them in again. So I think it's serving, you know, a dual purpose in that sense, that the heightened awareness is probably gonna save some of these kids. And the coaches are being put on the hot seat a little bit to be aware of everything going on. Now, Go ahead. I actually don't agree. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. No, no. <laughs> no, no. Not that I disagree with you. I disagree with the notion that it's increasing liability. Okay. okay. Because when Good. we look at... But people are afraid of that. Like, yeah, people are afraid of that. Yeah. People are always afraid of that. Yeah. And in some ways, that's good. But there are states where this has already been in place for... Mm -hmm. At 35 least, states. At least two <laughs> years. States. And there hasn't been an increase okay. in liability issues. There hasn't been an increase in lawsuits. The reality is that a law like this can actually protect the coach. Mm -hmm. Because if the coach does what is expected of the coach, then the coach is protected under liability laws. And it states that in the law. So all we need is for the coaches to do what they are required to do. And if they do that, they have more protection with a bill like this than they do if they didn't have it. Okay. Uh, we have a, a call now from Nantigla. We have Bill on the line. What's your question, please, Bill? Hi, yes. I'm just calling to see uh, more specifics about the bill and also how much support it may have, what chances it may have of being passed, and uh, how it would be enforced if it is indeed passed. Thank you very much. It has passed. Yes. Oh. Bill, it has passed. Yes, it, it is law in uh, Pennsylvania, and I believe it becomes fully operational July 1 so that um, it, it is there and there are, are clear guidelines in terms of how it will be enforced. Will parents be required to uh, have some training? At this point I know in the law it doesn't state it has an education policy and what it does is it invites coaches, parents, teachers, that type of thing to be educated and it also stipulates that you can have yearly meetings, seasonal meetings in order to help educate them it's a broad statement of how to do it. So they don't have to turn in a certificate, you know, that yes, they've been trained, but the educational part is falling onto the schools and that type of thing to make sure that multiple people are educated along the way. But the statement is it's broad at this point in hopes of bringing, I think, as many people in as possible. Okay. Yeah, I read that there a, was a 200% increase in the number of uh, athletes, high school athletes, who were taken to the emergency room in the last couple of years. Uh, and, and so the question for me is, when should a coach send an athlete like Adam to the uh, to the emergency room and, and I should ask did you go to the emergency room yeah I went on my very first concussion but on the other ones I just went to Etchmendia okay and, and so what would determine whether you should go and what happens in the emergency room well one of the key factors of, of taking somebody to the emergency room is number one if you're very scared if you're if you're looking at something and you think that this that this player is not doing well they're not responding well when in doubt get them to the emergency room. Let, let somebody else make that decision. It's not your job to be the doctor at that point in time. What you want to be careful of is any worsening signs. 
if individuals starting to get a headache and those headaches are starting to get worse, whether their nausea is starting to get worse, whether they're having a, an excruciating throbbing headache, whether they're becoming much more lethargic over time. Under those situations, they should be taken to the emergency room. And what room will be done right for away. them? Well, what we're looking for there is a more serious brain, brain injury, for example, a brain bleed. And we want to intervene with something like that very quickly and they may require neurosurgery on an emergency basis. And it's important to do that quickly because the, the quicker that gets evacuated, the, the more brain tissue that's going to be saved in doing that. But if it's a concussion and it doesn't require any emergency treatment, what will typically happen in the emergency room is that they'll be evaluated, they'll be looked at, their symptoms will be monitored, they may be given some medication to help with, with the symptoms, and the parents may be educated in terms of what to do next. So that's typical. But you may also hear in the emergency room, oh, when their symptoms abate, they can go back to play. And then that's when you need to go back and, and talk to somebody who's more expert in the area. Okay. Dana from State College, you are on the air. We can't hear you. Can you repeat your question, Dana? Competitive cyclist. I'm sorry. Dana, do you have a question for us? I do. Okay. Um, I'm a competitive cyclist, and I've had several head injuries due to um, head trauma. And could that have affected my sense of smell? Hmm. Yes, Dana, it can. Um, there are multiple brain injuries or even one brain injury can affect the sense of smell because the olfactory nerves lie right underneath this bridge of the brain and that's typically the area that gets hit, that frontal area or the side area and that can very much affect the olfactory bulb and the olfactory nerves which will either diminish or in some cases totally eliminate your sense of smell. All right, thank you for your phone call. Um, speaking of cyclists, cyclists are, are told that they should uh, re replace their helmet every couple of years, that, that what makes uh, it shock absorbent um, breaks down over time. Is that a sales pitch or is that good advice? No, that is good advice because um, cycling helmets are what are called one-hit helmets. And that just is just like your child's car seat. Just like your car's car seat. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Get rid if of you it. fall off your bike and you hit the ground and your helmet hits the ground, you need a new helmet because it's not designed to take multiple hits like a football helmet or a mm -hmm. lacrosse helmet. Those helmets are designed to take multiple hits, but not a cycling helmet. Wow. Getting back to helmets, the University of, uh, uh, or Purdue University did a, a, a year long study with sensors in helmets. And at the end of the season, they found that students who didn't even report or think they had concussions, that their cognitive abilities had declined over the space of the season, the, the football season. That, that's disturbing. Those are preliminary findings. Um, it was done with a very small sample of individuals. But yes, it's, it's interesting that you'll have these individuals who have played a whole season and there's been a decline in the cognitive functioning that, you know, independent of any type of concussion. What's interesting to look at and to examine in those cases are controls. Is, is this a, a function of fatigue? Is this a function of fatigue over mm -hmm. an entire season? Is this, you know, by the time they Trying get to the... Trying to balance both. Right, by, by the time they get to the end of the season, they, they just don't want to play anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, and many athletes will tell you that, that, that they're fed up, they, they've had it. So it, it is an interesting finding, and one, we need to get into that further and find out what's going on with other controls, but I, I do think it's important to look at. All right, we go to Andrew, who's calling us from State College. Andrew, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, this question is for Adam. Um, Adam, what advice would you give to young athletes that, have, that may or may not be in a, a similar situation to yourself? And, and how do you, especially if they've been facing, you know, maybe having to give up their sport, what do you tell them or, or you know, for how do they move on? Uh, I would just say that you have to, uh, you have to be honest. That's a, that's a big key to be honest with yourself and be honest with doctors. That way you don't hurt yourself in the long run. But, uh, just uh, just believe in God and that, let him take you through the path that he wants you to go through and you'll get to the next thing in life. Did, did, uh, did you have a sense that uh, uh, you were really putting your life at risk if you uh, continued to play? Uh, yeah, I'd say so because like 
you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know 40 years now if I'll be able to remember my own name or if I'll be able to count to 10. Like, you just can't tell. So I think giving up is a good thing, even though I love the sport so much. It, it could be beneficial to me in the long run. That way I don't have those side effects. What factors influence uh, recovery time? You know, some kids can get a hit and they're good the next day or a week from then. Some take a month. Some months later are still suffering from some of these side effects. We really don't understand that very well. We don't understand why some kids are more susceptible to others uh, to concussions, why some take a lot longer to recover. We have anecdotal evidence that shows that if you have multiple concussions or concussions that are closely spaced in time, that that tends to have symptoms that last longer, are more severe, are more prolonged. Um, there are issues with respect to diet and nutrition and, and how well people are taking care of themselves following the concussion, whether they're following advice. So there are a lot of different factors that, that come into play and unfortunately we don't have that crystal ball. We'd like to be able to, to know it, but we fully don't understand it. Hmm. Uh, here's another email question. Why is this law not applied to professional athletes who are these students, uh, student athletes role models? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> and you work with a number of professional <laughs> yes, teams. Because I think well, they're changing. Well, I think that, that the issue here is that professional athletes sign up to play a sport and they're um, compensated handsomely for playing that sport. They understand the risks of those sports. And typically, the government doesn't intervene at that level in terms of making laws. Now, with the youth athlete, it's very different. We don't have someone who can fully understand the laws. We, we don't have the resources at the youth level that we do at the professional level. On the sideline of a professional game, you can have a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, a neuropsychologist, orthopedic surgeon. You can have the whole array of medical staff. You don't have that at the level of the youth athletes. So I believe that legislators felt and the government felt that they need to intervene more in order to ensure the safety of our youth athletes. All right. We're going to take a couple of questions in a moment, but first, if you are just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live, the new concussion bill on WPSU-TV. Let me reintroduce our guests. Ruben Echemendia is a neuropsychologist and owner of Psychological and Neurobehavioral Associates in State College. Allison Krajewski is the head athletic trainer at State College High School and the clinical coordinator of athletic training services for university orthopedics. Adam Yarger is a student and former athlete who was forced to retire from contact sports due to multiple head injuries. And we go now to Susan from Dubois who has a question for us. My question that I have for you tonight is, um, does the bill cover the transfer of information about what's happening on the athletic field with the concussion? Does that information get shared with the teachers in the classroom so that the educational needs of the students are addressed? Allison, good question. It's a great question, and I, I, most of the time I do believe that there's a gap in that information from the doctors to the teachers and on down the line for the whole support system. Here at, um, in the State College Area School District, we do have that connection where we do have permission from the parents to allow the counselors to know so that the word can be spread, not in a lot of detail, but just to let them know that there is an, a student athlete who's going to be dealing with symptoms of a concussion and that they're going to need some extra time to complete their work because of the cognitive deficits that they do have. But in terms of every school having that, no, that's not the case. Adam, you're from Penns Valley. Were there any accommodations as a result of your concussions? Uh, yeah, there definitely were. It was a little bit of a struggle to get them, <laughs> but uh, from my experience, I feel that not only do the the students and the coaches need education on concussions, but I think the teachers also do because from what I was seeing, some of my teachers, they, I don't think they understood what I was going through and they didn't get a feel for it. And I just feel that teachers need that education just as much as the parents and the coaches and the students do. Can you tell us a little bit about the kinds of school problems you might have been having? Was, was reading more difficult? Oh yeah, reading was pretty hard for me. I, I'd, I'd read the book and it was just, it wasn't blurry, but it was just really hard for me to, uh, 
comprehend what I was reading and it would just give me the nastiest headaches and it was tough so usually I'd have to get like a audio book and just listen to it and then take notes doing it that way. Wow. And, and how typical is Adam's experience? That's fairly typical. One of the things that we see when kids go back into school is that any type of exertion that the brain goes through is going to worsen the symptoms. So what happens when you go to school? You, you're exerted cognitively. You have to think. So as they go through the day, the headache typically gets worse and worse and worse. Then you get the bright lights, and you get the teacher, and you get the friends, and the commotion. And sitting and, in front of a and computer sitting in screen. front of a computer, getting out into the halls, getting into a bus. All of that just wreaks havoc on the brain and really exacerbates the symptoms. They go through a really hard time. I think that, that the question was a very good one, and that the bill does not address that specifically. And hopefully as we move down the line, that's the direction that we're going to be moving into. And that is getting more uniform practices within the school districts on how to deal with kids who are coming in with brain injuries and with concussions. All right. We have another uh, caller online and then an email uh, question. Uh, Chris from State College, go ahead, please. Um, um, my name is Chris Going, and I attend State High Area School dis District. Um, uh -huh. My question is for Adam, and I just wanted to know if having a past of, like, concussions, can you still do non-physical uh, sports, like track and field? Uh, yeah, I can do uh, non-contact sports. I can do, like, lifting, uh, cross-country, track. I don't think doing pole vault would be a very good idea <laughs> with having my concussions, but... Yeah, I can definitely do other kinds of sports, just not contact. And do you? Uh, I tried cross country, but that it just wasn't me. Like it wasn't who I am, and it, I just didn't like it. So mm -hmm. I just sort of gave that up. All right. So we thank you for your phone call, Chris. Uh, we go to an email question: Are the high school sports changing the rules to lessen the likelihood of concussions, similar to college and NFL recent rule changes? And we sort of touched on that. Yeah. We did. I mean, there's certain changes that they're trying to make. The bill does help with that more in terms of awareness and treatment. And the game will definitely be changing as the NFL and other, you know, entities change their rules. Dr. Richmond, you might be able to add to that. Well, and also the different sports organizations mm -hmm. are starting to, to look at this issue more carefully and to try to, to come up with rule changes or to look at how they can affect changes that will minimize concussion. For example, I'm on the U.S. Lacrosse Sports Safety Committee, and that's one of the things that's actively being looked at in U.S. Lacrosse, and that is how, are there ways that, that we can make rule changes that, that may be beneficial in terms of reducing the effect of concussions? You say that, at least last year, you said that the NFL, the NHL, has done more to prevent concussions than any other professional sport. Well, Do you still believe that? I, I, I firmly believe that the NHL has had a very comprehensive program that's been in place since 1997. It's, it's, it's the league that's had a program in place for the longest. Whether we've, we've done the most, that, that's hard to, to quantify, but certainly the, the impetus has been there, the program has been there, and a lot of leagues have looked to the NHL because of what they've done over the years. Uh, let's switch to the NFL. Um, we're reading almost monthly about uh, football players in in groups suing the you know in federal lawsuits suing the NFL because of concussions and because of uh, what they say is dementia and other problems as a result of them. Uh, where do you think all of that is is, is going and, and what can you tell us about some of the findings, the CTE findings and these top proteins that we're finding um, on autopsy uh, among former football players? That's, that's a, a loaded, lot, wasn't it? That's a loaded <laughs> question there, Patty. Uh, let's see what we can do with it. Um, in terms of why the lawsuits and what's going on, I, I think that all of this is coming from awareness. People are now starting to become more aware of this injury. They are starting to recognize that it can have long-term consequences and that maybe um, they felt like they hadn't been managed the way that they needed to be or that information wasn't given to them that uh, maybe was available. So I think as, as awareness grows, different questions start to arise about this injury. The, in terms of long-term consequences and the tau proteins and what's called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the, there has been uh, the group out in Boston, the Sports Legacy Institute, and the Boston University group 
have autopsied or they have brains of about 20 NFL players at this point in time that have shown some evidence of chronic traumatic encephalopathy or this abnormal protein that's that's built up inside the brain that stains brown and it, it, that's alarming it's alarming in the sense that there is clear evidence that there is some pathology what's problematic at this point is that we don't understand what's causing that pathology. It is speculated that it is repetitive head blows and it looks like it's repetitive head blows, but we don't know who gets it, why they get it, who doesn't get it. They've studied it in a very small group of individuals. We don't know to what extent it does or does not occur in the normal population or the non-sports population. We don't know what factors come into play with respect to CTE. Is it lifestyle? issues is it or is it just playing football we don't know are doctors like uh, Ann McKee beginning to look at uh, uh, brains of non-athletes to compare to see if they have these tall proteins um, and they haven't had concussions although lots of people don't know they've had concussions by the way that's uh, that's true and a lot of what happens is retrospective and that is now you're having to look back at how many concussions have you had and if you stop to think about it people are not very good with retrospective memory you know, it's how many concussions have you had? And then the number starts going in, in widely different directions. But I, I think that, yes, they are. I, I know that Dr. McKee is starting to, to look at other things. And the, you know, the gauntlet is down now in terms of science that says you need to figure out what's going on here. You need to find out why some of these people are getting this type of pathology and why some are not getting this type of pathology and then use that information to try to make changes as needed. We also need to be able to develop and identify this pathology prior to somebody dying. We need to be able to figure out if, we, if there are markers out there that will help us to understand when they've had too many concussions, when they've had issues. And the other thing is that it's not even concussions anymore. It's this notion of sub-concussive head blows and the number of blows that you're getting to your head, not just the number of concussions. And, and that's happening in just about every sport. Yes, the, the likelihood of a sub-concussive hit is definitely there across the board that you people can be suffering and not even realize that that's what's going on. Okay. We go to Vicki, who is calling us from Port Matilda. Go ahead, please, Vicki. Hi. Um, my question is for uh, Dr. Ekmandia. My son actually saw you last year. He plays uh, hockey through Skya, and he had a, uh, a, he had a baseline impact test at um, a bald eagle, and then he also... Um, well, we actually, my husband followed up with you, and you didn't like the test, and we waited a few more weeks, and he retested, and um, he was okay to play, but this year he was playing hockey uh, at the beginning of the year, and he, the, the, he tripped anyway. He went right into the wall in his head, and he didn't play for a few weeks, but, and he didn't really have very many symptoms at all, but I noticed his memory isn't as sharp as it used to be. There, there is a definite change in his memory. And I was just wondering, I, they stopped the checking, the, the hockey league has stopped the checking at the peewee level. Because, we, I mean, my kid is small, he's fast but small, and a kid came, a huge kid came from uh, right, hit him right in the back and he flew right into the air. Um, and, you know, on the jerseys it says stop, uh, they're not allowed to hit from behind. But is there any kind of movement to try to stop the checking at all at the, at the, at the youth level, 18 and under? Um, they're actually, and it, does it affect the memory? Can it continue to affect the memory? Well, Vicki, it, it, it can continue to affect the memory. And after having a second hit like that, it could have affected the memory such that his memory is not as good as it was before. If there is previous testing, it may be advantageous to test again to be able to determine whether indeed there are changes in memory. With respect to the checking, that yes, that there is a mo movement afoot to change checking and introduce it at different levels. It's actually starting up in Canada. They have prevented checking or they're, they're moving towards preventing body checking from the ages of 14 and below in certain provinces and then only introducing checking 14 and above. Okay. All right. Thank you for your call. We go to Marion, who's calling us from State College. Marion, what's your question, please? Uh, our question is this. Is um, concussions more serious uh, with girls than with boys? We have a granddaughter. It's a high school senior, and she got hit with a hockey stick right smack in the middle of the forehead. This is five and a half months. 
and she's still having severe headaches, getting very good, we believe, medical treatment, treatment, but she can't watch movies, television, or so on. How long might uh, these serious symptoms continue? Do you want to go ahead with that one? Well, um, the first part of your question, Marion, is um, there is more concern in terms of women and girls with concussions. That uh, The data tend to show, the studies are showing that if you look at the similar sports, that women in many cases have a higher incidence of concussion than do the men. Um, in your case in particular, you know, it, it sounds like she did have a pretty nasty concussion. She's continuing to have symptoms. I'm not sure that that's related to whether she's a girl or not or whether it's just related to the type of injury that she sustained and her history and that is what's prolonging the the symptoms at this point in time and and your physicians are the best to to be able to answer that question for you. All right, thank you so much for your phone call. I'm wondering with you Adam, you had the baseline tests and then you had tests with Dr. Echemendia. By, by your last test, were you back to the same cognitive level that you were pre-sports injury? Uh, throughout all my concussions, I was put on a mantidine, and that actually, like in the testing that I've taken between my baseline and where I'm at right now, the tests I've taken in between that, it actually got higher. Some of the numbers got higher, like the reaction speed was higher than what the baseline was, and I, I just looked like a, uh, like a superhuman kind of guy on this semantidine. <laughs> and so, yeah, but now I'm back to close or what the baseline was. Okay, all right. With, ju okay. Um, with just a second, what final advice? I'll ask you, Allison, in, in just 15 seconds, what advice do you have for parents? Uh, they need to look out for their children. Are their children acting the way they should be? And please feel free to contact us and let us okay. know. All right. Our guests tonight have been Ru uh, Ruben Echemendia. He's a neuropsychologist in State College. Allison Cryfiske, who's uh, with uh, a, a, an athletic trainer at State College High, and Adam Yarger, a student at Penns Valley. For all of us at WPSU, I'm Patty Satalia. Thanks for watching.